Welcome to the Grain Management and Low Margin Years video series. I'm Brian Jensen with the IPM program and UW Extension at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. My topic will be managing insects economically. I'll cover three topics, one including independent crop consultants, using conventional hybrids, and also a little bit about economic thresholds. It may seem unconventional uh, to uh, talk about hiring uh, independent crop consultants in a year when we're trying to reduce costs, but I'll cover some of the advantages and disadvantages of hiring uh, independent crop consultants. As far as using uh, conventional hybrids, we've seen a shift with growers trying to save money, going from GMO hybrids back to conventional corn. A uh, quick update on how that can be done efficiently so that you're not caught by surprise with any problem on down the road. And also you can save money using uh, economic thresholds for managing insects. What is an independent crop consultant? There's no official definition. I'll kind of give you what I think uh, an independent crop consultant is. It's one who offers consultative services. They receive the majority, if not all, of their income from those services, and there is minimal connection with compensation uh, from sales. Some of the services that an independent can provide, it will vary quite a bit from one consultant to the next, but some of the uh, services may include routine field scouting, soil and or plant tissue sampling, input recommendations for insects, weeds, and diseases, input and recommendations for crop nutrients, as well as crop production in general. They may also help you with conservation planning, nutrient management planning, and crop, crop budget analysis. Some of the advantages that timely field scouting leads to improved control. Uh, you're catching weeds at an early stage, insects at an early stage where, where they can be easily controlled. As a result, that's going to reduce crop losses. It also avoids unnecessary applications and it helps develop a pest history over time so that you can make uh, decisions, for example, with secondary insect pests like white grubs and, white wor and wire worms rather, uh, more efficiently. Independent crop consultants walk a lot of acres. They see a lot of uh, pests uh, uh, and they have first-hand experience with monitoring those acres. The majority of independent crop consultants are certified crop advisors. That is a program that's administered by the American Society of Agronomy. It indicates a base level of knowledge in that each certified crop advisor has to pass two comprehensive exams. Also, continuing education units are required to the extent that within a two-year period of time, they have to attend 40 credit hours of training. Certified crop advisors, or CCAs, uh, also have to uh, adhere to a code of ethics, which includes client com confidentiality. Uh, it also indicates that they should protect interests of the clients by recommending only those products and or services that are in their client's best interest. They shall not give professional uh, opinion or advice, make recommendations without being thoroughly informed. And also, a CCA should not issue a false statement or false information, even if directed so by the employer. Independent crop consultants also uh, provide you unbiased crop management advice in that they are not connected to sales or if they are, sales should be a very small portion of their uh, um, business. You hire independent crop consultants, and they work for a limited number of people. That being, you can get in touch with them easily, and they will get back to you because of their uh, somewhat low uh, client load. And also, all information they provide to you is confidential. 
Basically, they provide you with all the information that you will need to make sound management decisions. And finally, uh, they provide peace of mind. And, and peace of mind is going to vary. The value of peace of mind is going to vary from one grower to the next. But um, I think one of their advantages is that they provide you that peace of mind knowing that your crops are being monitored and that the best recommendations are going to be made available to you. Some of the disadvantages, there's a fee associated with these uh, independent uh, crop consultants. That is how they make their living. You can do the field scouting yourself if you have the training, the experience, and especially the time. There is no reason why you can't do that scouting yourself, but it just takes a little bit of time. Uh, anyone can claim independence, do check references, and also ask for whatever connection they might have to sales. Also a disadvantage of independent crop consultants is that their management philosophies can vary from yours. Yeah, uh, check references, uh, talk to them about their general philosophies towards uh, passing crop management and see if the, the two of you get along. When considering hiring a consultant, if you do, it's not for everyone, ask for their background education, their experience, and any references that they would be willing to provide you. And also uh, ask about their continuing education plans. What meetings, what conferences they go to to uh, stay up to date. Now for that second topic, that is switching to conventional hybrids. Do consider why did you switch in the first place? I think in a lot of cases you might answer for convenience. Um, that may not be the, uh, the only reason, but I think one of the top reasons, and arguably so, is that a lot of people switch because of the convenience that the GMO hybrids provide. If you make that switch to conventional hybrids, are you prepared to do the field scouting or accept the risks if you don't? And are you prepared to make the control recommendations if needed? There are some costs involved with switching to the conventional hybrids. On this screen, I have some estimates for what the different traits might cost you. Your actual cost may vary up or down a little bit, but these are baseline ballpark estimates. The estimates that I have gotten for the above ground traits are roughly $65 per bag on the average with a range of between $35 and $90 per bag. For that traded corn with both above and below ground traits, an average uh, is $125 per bag with a range between $100 and $175 per bag. When comparing the cost of these traits, don't just look at prices. Do compare genetics. Make sure you're getting value there uh, if you go with conventional uh, hybrids. Also, when comparing the individual traits, look at the insects that are controlled as well as those that are suppressed. Suppression means a much lower level of control, um, so that's important to know and understand. Okay, some things to consider when switching from the below ground traded corn. First is remember that corn rootworm control is only needed on continuous corn. There is no reason to have the GMO hybrids for first year corn. However, there are some exceptions. In the southern and so southeast part of Wisconsin, in the past, the western corn rootworm has been known to lay eggs in soybeans. If that is the case, you may need some level of control on first year corn. But uh, in the past, including this year, most of the people that I've talked to, they have not seen that, that phenomenon of rootworms laying eggs in, in uh, soybeans much in recent history. Also remember that most at plant soil insecticide treatments for rootworms are restricted use pesticides, meaning you have to be trained and licensed before you can buy and or use them. There are two exceptions. Lorsban 15G 
is a general use pesticide. You can buy that without any training, without any licensing. And also treat, seed treatments are general use insecticides. Some application considerations um, prior to using that plant soil uh, insecticides. Number one, is your planter equipped with granular insecticide boxes, whether they're the old style open delivery boxes or the newer style closed delivery boxes. Um, I guess what I'm getting at here is when you make that switch from traded corn to conventional corn, and if you're gonna be growing continuous corn, you will need options uh, to control corn worms and do consider ahead of time the cost of those boxes. If you're not gonna use the boxes, you'll have to uh, plumb your planter for the liquid rootworm insecticides, or uh, if you have dry starter fertilizer, you will need to equip your planter with liquid fertilizer units. And also, regardless of which method you, you use to control core rootworms, you'll have to make sure that uh, all application methods are calibrated properly. I got some estimates on the cost of uh, insecticide boxes. There are some used ones out there available. Uh, it's kind of a range between $75 uh, per box, upwards of $250 per box. New units, whether it's for a finger type planter or the vacuum planters, were pretty consistent between $400 to $500 per roll. Another option for the uh, uh, granular insecticides are to use the, uh, the smart boxes. Without mounting brackets, brackets, the costs that I've seen are approximately $400 per row for a 48-row planter, and that goes up uh, with the economy of scale to $500 per 12-row unit. Also starting this past year in 2016, there is another delivery method. That's a Thrive 3D system, uh, which uses a capture uh, uh, Thrive 3D uh, insecticide or in form formulation. There are uh, startup costs for that, and they roughly $27,000 total for a 24 row system or 20,000 for a 12 row system. Uh, also, there are rebates included with product sales and things like that, roughly about $60 per gallon. I guess my point with this slide is when you do make that conversion from the GMO hybrids or traded hybrids to the conventional corn, you need to have some method to control them. And if you don't have that method to control rootworms, uh, these are some approximate costs that it might take to equip your planter. In looking at the cost of seed treatments, they are um, about $4.80 per acre as compared to the soil applied insecticides. You know, there's a bit of a range there depending on product, anywhere is between $9 and $20 uh, per acre with an average of, you know, roughly $14 or $15 per acre. Do keep in mind as you make that switch from the traded hybrids to the uh, conventional hybrids, there is an, an additional value to doing so. And, that's, and what I'm talking about is BT resistance management. Um, there is quite a concern in the last few years uh, in preserving these uh, BT hybrids and to help preserve them, we need to uh, diversify our management practices that could include, certainly will include rotation, seed treatments, as well as soil applied at plant insecticides. There's, so there's extra value in going to the uh, conventional methods of rootworm control. As we're making that switch or anticipating making that switch, let's uh, consider the efficacy of the soil applied insecticides. In other words, how well do the individual insecticides work? I'll provide you in a, in a slide or two uh, our rootworm efficacy trial data. And what I call it is my consistency data from the years 2001 to 2013. 
I don't have data for you prior to that because we're on a different evaluation system than what we are right now and our numbers are back are not backwards compatible to the old uh, uh, system of rating corn roots and in 2014 to current day we use a different method of attracting corn rootworms into our plots and in that case I get extremely high numbers of rootworm beetles so I've at least for the time be, being I'm concentrating on the years 2001 to 2013. Uh, to consider an insecticide, uh, to consider an insecticide that has acceptable control, it needs to perform lower uh, than a 0 0.5 injury scale. That meaning uh, 0 0.5, there's one half of a node of roots that are pruned back. I think most entomologists will assume that actual threshold is 0 0.75 or three quarters of a no node ruined. Uh, node of roots pruned back. I'm being a little bit more conservative with uh, my estimate for these uh, consistency ratings. Also for a, an insecticide to be included in, in this consistency data, the untreated check had to have significant pressure and in my rating system that nodal injury scale had to be greater than 1.0 or one complete node of roots pruned back. All plots were conducted at the UW uh, Arlington Ag Research Station in corn following late planted corn, which served as a trap crop. That guarantees me damage. It also guarantees me fairly high pressure of uh, rootworm beetles. So my point there is that these are usually populations that are quite high, uh, higher than what you might expect to see in most fields. I only use data from those treatments that were applied at the current rootworm labeled rate. A lot of times we'll have uh, different rates that we're looking at, at to, uh, in order to dial in a, uh, a, uh, an acceptable range for control. I only used those rates that were uh, labeled. Uh, data from experimental formulations, although it was the same active ingredient, were not used. And I lumped all placements together, both furrow and T-band. Over the years, we don't see a big difference between the two, as well as all application methods were clumped together, whether it was a, uh, uh, an open delivery system or a closed delivery system. Here's a table um, that I was referring to. For example, in that top row, we have both Aztec 2.1, Aztec 4.67, they're both granules, they're soil applied, and in that top row, Aztec 2.1 2 uh, provided me a, a high consistency rating in 21 out of 30 trials. And Aztec 4.67G, uh, two out of three trials. Uh, capture, uh, not looking as good for us in, in recent years. Uh, it might be an insecticide that's better suited for um, fields with low populations of corn rootworms. Counter 15 and 20G, uh, four out of five years it provided consistency. Uh, not a lot of trials uh, that are represented here in part because counter was labeled uh, long ago and we had done a lot of work with counter, both formulations as well as other formulations under that old rating system that is not forward compatible to our, our current rating system, but there's no reason for me to think that uh, the formulations of counter would be any different than what we see on, uh, on this chart. Uh, Force 3G, 18 out of 29 treatments that looked good. Uh, that was a bit surprising, surprising to me uh, going back over the data. I still consider uh, that fairly good uh, results. And again, these are are trials under extremely high rootworm pressures. For CS or the liquid formulation uh, provided us acceptable control in nine out of nine trials. And that final line is Lorsban 15G. Not so well, that is a one product that is of general use. Uh, and because of the that consistency data, um, I guess I would prefer to have someone to get trained and certified uh, for the other restricted use 
products that you see listed above. This next uh, slide is for the efficacy of the seed treatments. Put in the same trials, uh, and, and again, this is corn planted after a trap crop. An extremely, uh, um, it, it's a situation where you would expect extremely high damage. It is not a situation where I would want to put a seed treatment in to control corn worms. I guess my point is, uh, it's not, uh, the damage in my trials would have been higher than I would have expected the seed treatments to work, but they stood, still did relatively good, working in about a third of the trials. We can get additional value from our conventional hybrids if we scout fields for beetles. Uh, roughly one to three field visits uh, during that period of time when the adults are laying eggs, that's early August through early September. And the threshold is if we see more than uh, three quarters of a beetle per plant on a field average, uh, we do need to treat or rotate out of corn in that field next year. If we're below that threshold of 0.75 beetles per plant on a field average, we don't need to treat at all. So the value we get from that field scouting is this. If we find in the previous year that we have extremely high beetle counts, our options would be to rotate, use soil applied insecticides. I think they will work adequately uh, or quite well if we choose the right insecticide. Um, and also, uh, you can maybe on these fields, you would want to consider using a GMO traded hybrid with a below ground trait. On those fields with medium beetle populations, rotation is still a real good method of control and is, is certainly a place where I would consider using soil applied insecticides. If we're at threshold, again, rotation is still an option. The soil applied insecticides are still an option, but that is also a situation that I might consider using a seed treatment. Here I have documented low beetle populations, and that would be an instance where I would expect the seed treatments to provide adequate control. Some people wonder, is it worthwhile to scout for beetles um, with the assumption that all continuous cornfields need some form of beetle control the, the following year? Uh, if we look at this map developed by the Wisconsin Department of Ag Trade and Consumer Protection, it kind of highlights the variability we have in beetle populations around the state. If you look at that uh, map closely, the red dots are those fields that are at or over threshold. Those fields will require some form of control next year in 2017. Those fields with a yellow dot are just below the economic threshold, uh, kind of what I would term a, a uh, uh, slightly below economic threshold, I guess I should say. Those that are green dots uh, have very light beetle pressure of 0.1 to 0.4 beetle per plant, and all of those black dots are fields where the survey personnel could not find any rootworm beetles in that field. So my point with this slide is beetle scouting can be uh, worth your time and effort, and I think uh, all of those red dots uh, kind of indicate that. Uh, they're spaced out uh, throughout the, um, the state. It's not just the southern part of the state that has high beetle pressure, uh, but also given that there's still a lot of uh, variability from one field to next for rootworm populations. Okay, um, in recent years with perceived high beetle populations, people have been adding a soil applied at plant insecticide with rootworm traits. Let's look at that as a possibility for saving dollars as well. If you have a single rootworm trait, uh, it is not gonna pay to use a soil applied insecticide with that trait unless you have extremely high beetle pressure. If you're using a dual uh, a hybrid with dual traits or a pyramid hybrid, I cannot think of a reason why adding uh, 
at plant soil applied insecticide is necessary. I would expect under all circumstances that pyramid hybrid to provide adequate control for corn rootworm feeding. Now let's look at switching uh, from uh, switching hybrids going from those with above ground traits to conventional hybrids. The uh, four insects I'll talk about briefly are European corn borer, uh, western bean cutworm, black cutworm, and also stalk borer. Current population trends uh, based on DAC cap surveys uh, for corn borers. In 2015, we had his historic low populations. That was based on the 74 year history of the corn borer survey. In 2016, we had somewhat higher populations, slightly higher populations, but also in some cases, uh, they were regionally higher, but those higher populations were very isolated in individual fields. So if one is considering going from the traded hybrids to the conventional, um, quite frankly, uh, in 2017, this might be a very good time period to do that because of low corn borer population. Western bean cutworm, in general, over the last few years, populations have been, in low, have been low in Wisconsin, but regionally high in the central part of the state. Black cutworms, which are an occasional pest and can be controlled by some of our traded hybrids. Um, I think we need to remember that they're an occasional pest. You will not get value from that above ground trait each and every year. Black cutworms are easily scouted for and we have economic thresholds available to use to help you decide when is the proper timing for control. Uh, for, for control I'm talking about using uh, broadcast foliar applied insecticides. Application timing is going to be somewhat critical, but as long as we're scouting our corn fields between V1 and V4, uh, we'll be well ahead of any uh, potential cutworm problems. Also, the last one I'll talk about is stock borers. Again, it's an isolated pest. Usually, uh, it's um, found along field edges next to grassy waterways, terraces, uh, and or weedy areas of the field, it's easily scouted. Uh, as long as we're scouting our early stage corn, V1 through V4, we can identify problems early on and come back with a well-timed uh, treatment, which usually can be uh, uh, what we would call a spot treatment, just treating those areas of the fields with stock borer. Let's take an example of first generation European corn borer uh, control without traits. What I would suggest doing is to start scouting my fields mid-June at about 600 growing degree days. Uh, and I would focus my energy on the earliest planted corn fields first. They are going to be most attractive to the adult to come in and lay eggs. The economic threshold uh, we'll talk about briefly. It is available in some of our extension publications. Uh, each larvae will cause about a 5% yield loss uh, in first generation. Let me give you a scouting scenario. Let's assume we were out scouting and we found that 50% of the plants were infested with an average of one larvae per infested plant. That's a field average of uh, about a 2.5% yield loss. Let's assume a, a expected yield of 180 bushel per acre Time, uh, times a 2.5% yield loss, we're looking at losing about 4.5 bushels in that situation. Uh, we'll assume a selling price of $4 per bushel. In that case, uh, we would expect about uh, $18 per acre loss from corn borers in that field. Then you just merely uh, compare your treatment costs with that $18 per acre uh, loss for corn borers. Second generation is going to be a little bit more difficult, I think, to control. We do scout for egg masses. As far as control expect expectations, do remember you're uh, scouting tasseling corn. You will need a high clearance sprayer if you need to treat. One of the other problems with second generation corn borer control is it's about a three week 
uh, flight period. So timing of control will be very difficult. It will be difficult to get complete control with one application. But also what helps a little bit is there's a lot of other hosts around the countryside that corn borers can be attracted to to lay eggs. And if you do find yourself with unexpected second generation uh, corn borer damage, you can always consider that field for early harvest. Black cutworm management, again, remember it's an occasional pest. We do not have a problem with it each and every year. Uh, to scout for it, I would suggest you go out and spot check fields at emergence. And those fields that I would spot check are those fields with soybean residue. The adults, for some reason, are really attracted to that, to that soybean residue to lay eggs. And are fields with a lot of broadleaf weed uh, growth early in the spring. Uh, the economic threshold for black cutworm would be to treat if you have 5% damaged plants. And in this slide, we can see a black cutworm in the upper right hand side and the range of damage that bl black cutworms can do. In the lower left, we see a little bit of leaf feeding. That's important to note that uh, damage not, is not considered economic. Uh, that, that is damage from a very small larvae on seedling corn and it gives you a little head up for what uh, could be coming. In that uh, middle bottom slide are some classical symptoms of cutworms cutting plants off at, at ground level. And in that uh, slide farthest to the right is what we call wilted whirl or dead heart. That's from a, a large black cutworm larvae burrowing, burrowing into that corn plant below ground level. And finally, let's talk about uh, using economic thresholds as a method for saving dollars in these low margin years. First, what is an economic threshold? It's that pest population that needs to be controlled to prevent, and that's an important part of the, the definition, to prevent economic loss. Using these economic thresholds incorporates dollars and cents into our control decisions. Also, economic thresholds that have been developed for most field crop insects, if not all field crop insects. At least the major ones certainly have economic thresholds developed. I'll talk a little bit about the soybean aphid economic threshold and walk you through um, that as a scenario uh, for economic thresholds. For soybean aphids, that threshold is uh, a three-part threshold we need to have an average of 250 aphids per plant on 80% of the plants only during the R1 through R5 growth periods. Uh, soybeans in the vegetative stages, uh, although you may find soybean aphids on, they do not cause economic loss, at least that we have ever been able to, to measure. And uh, growth stage six and beyond, uh, Soybean aphids do not cause economic loss, primarily because most of our uh, yield has been made by that R6 growth stage. These thresholds have been developed through university collaborations. It includes most uh, close monitoring of replicated research trials. Data has been gathered from multiple sites and from several years across a soybean producing states, uh, including Wisconsin. The results are, I hope, unbiased. They are developed by university uh, staff and faculty, and they are peer reviewed. And what I mean by that is other um, entomology researchers look at the data, look at our results, and they decide whether or not that information is, is valid or not. Let's give you a little more background information on the soybean aphid economic threshold. At the economic threshold of 250 per plant, we have not been able to measure uh, yield loss, whether it's economic or not. We have not been able to measure yield loss. It is, uh, therefore, a very conservative number. It's a very conservative estimate. And it's important at that economic threshold of 250 per plant that the population is increasing because we can measure economic loss at uh, somewhere between 
six to 700 aphids per plant. Therefore, spraying um, uh, prior to the economic threshold of 250 per plant will not be economical, and you're probably wondering, why have we set that economic threshold so low? It's two part, primarily because of the population dynamics of soybean aphids. They can increase in populations in a very short period of time. Therefore, we want to give people uh, a little lead time yeah, so that they can pre prepare, prepare uh, to spray. So again, that's twofold. Uh, because of the population dynamics of the soybean aphid, they increase so quick, and also because we want to give you, build in a little lead time before you need to spray. So uh, do you adjust the economic threshold with lower insecticide costs or changing commodity prices? To be truthful, both of those situations have little effect on the economic threshold. Again, remember we do not, cannot measure yield loss at the economic threshold of 250 per plant. However, there are consequ consequences if we lower the economic threshold uh, and spray before that. We will kill off beneficial insects. And as a result, soybean populations can and will rebound after that. Uh, especially if those uh, natural enemies are no longer present. As a result, we may have to spray a second time. Also, secondary insect pests, for example, two-spotted spider mites, may rebound in the absence of uh, their natural enemies. And we also have to remember, too, that as soon as we drive into that field, assuming we're using ground application, we will suffer some small yield loss just because of uh, wheel traffic. There's places to go for help. Uh, I'm sure in this short video we have not been able to give you all the information you need and you may have questions coming up later. Always remember to contact your local county extension agent if you have any questions. Uh, do consider getting a subscription to the Wisconsin Crop Manager newsletter. It's a free newsletter. You have the uh, the site to uh, subscribe to it. And also uh, the Department of Ag has their pest bulletin as well as the site where you can subscribe to. The Wisconsin Crop Manager will give a bit of a heads up on, on pest problems and crop management problems we're dealing with as well as how to manage them. The pest bulletin put out by the Wisconsin Department of Ag is an outstanding first alert bulletin. Uh, that bulletin comes out on, on a weekly basis during the summer and it will give you a heads up for when they're find, finding problems in the field. Thank you.